Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 21. It says, And at the end of eight days he was, circum- he was circumcised. He was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came, f- came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. As it is written in the law of Moses, Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was, was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the con- consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit of, in the, into the temple, and when the parents brought, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the, to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the, for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was eighty-four. She did not depart from the temple worshiping, with fasting and prayer night and day. And And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the Lord's Word. You can be seated. Let's pray. Uh, gracious God, thank you so much for your word, Father. We thank you for Jesus, Lord. As we enter this season of, uh, of celebrating the resurrection, God, I pray that, uh, that you would soften our hearts to your word. I pray, Father, that we, would, uh, that we would just begin to think about you more, that we would begin to pursue you more, that we would get into your word more, Lord, that we would seek to live our lives in a way that is, that is more holy to you, that is more pleasing to you, God. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us to live a life of just anticipation, God, that we would be looking forward eagerly to the day when you come home, Lord, to the day that you come to get us, God, to the day when you will come and make all things new. God, we, we look forward to that day. Father, I pray that if there's sin in any of our lives, God, that you would shed light upon it, that you would bring us to a point of repentance, God. I pray, Father, that you would be glorified in here this morning. I pray, God, that you would use me as a tool in your hands, God, to accomplish whatever you want to be done this morning, Lord. And I pray that if there's anything in our lives that's hindering us from worshiping you with our whole hearts this morning and walking in obedience to your word preached, God, I pray that you would uh, remove those things by the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would come and fill this place and have your way here. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you guys about anticipation. Anticipation. Right? Anticipation, if you look it up in the dictionary, um, it's defined this way. It says, the action of anticipating something, you know, or expectation or prediction. Right? So it's, it's looking forward to something. Uh, I remember being a little kid. I wasn't a believer, but we celebrated Christmas because, well, we're Americans, and everybody celebrates Christmas in America for the most part. Uh, and so I remember, but when I was a kid, every year, you know, it, it would just blow my mind because I, it was Santa Claus who would uh, apparently bring presents, uh, you know, out under the tree overnight. And so I would go to, you know, I, once my parents could actually force me to slow down and stop talking about all the presents I was going to get the next morning, and I was actually able to go to sleep, you know, I'd wake up in the morning, and I don't know how I did it, but I'd wake up at like 5 o'clock, no alarm clock or anything else. I'd run out there, and there would just be massive piles of presents under the tree. I had no idea how they got there, but I remember uh, the anticipation for Christmas would set in probably a month or two beforehand, and it's weird because as I've gotten older, and especially as I've become a believer, and I know what Christmas is, um, I can start celebrating Christmas in February. You know, I can start looking forward to Christmas in February. Like, I'm one of those guys, like, you very well might find me listening to Christmas music at off months and at off times, uh, because I love what Christmas is about. Right? But I remember one of the earliest Christmases I can remember, I was probably two or three years old, and I didn't really go to sleep. I, I couldn't sleep. And I remember getting up at about four or five in the morning, 
and running downstairs, and I could not contain myself. My parents were still in bed, and I tore into every single one of those presents under the tree. I opened them up, and I took everything out. I didn't know what all of it was, but as far as I was concerned, they were all mine, and everything there was for me, and it was amazing. You know, it was the best Christmas ever until my dad got up. My dad got up, and he came down, and he saw that I'd gotten into all the presents under the tree. Like, I had never gotten a butt spanking like I did that Christmas morning. Like, I probably got the worst spanking I can remember on Christmas morning because I tore into every single present under the tree. But I was just that excited. Like, I couldn't wait. You know, and so anticipation, right? When something sets in, you get so excited about something. I mean, you're looking forward to it, and you just can't wait until that happens, whatever that thing is. Anticipation. I remember I anticipated, I was eagerly looking forward to Christmas that year. You know, that time my inability to wait got me into trouble, but anticipation in and of itself is a good thing. You know, as a matter of fact, the the Bible tells us that we are supposed to uh, look forward to Christ's return with, you know, with eager expectation. Uh, We are to look forward to Christ's return uh, more than we look forward to anything else in the world. You know, uh, the Bible commends those who faithfully and patiently wait on God. You know, the Bible tells us to be holy people with holy anticipation. Uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16, uh, Peter writes to, uh, to to his readers, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Now this is after Jesus came. This is after Jesus shed his blood on the cross. This is after, you know, the gospel had taken place. Jesus had resurrected. He had ascended into heaven. And so he's now in that time period that you and I are in, where we're now waiting for Jesus to come back. And yet he still reinforces this Old Testament command, Be holy as I am holy, is what God's telling us in that that command. You know, the, the idea of being holy is to be set apart from the world for God. You know, it's a daily thing. It's something that we strive for daily. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. It causes us to constantly examine our hearts and look at our hearts against the Word of God. Look at the things that we desire and examine them against the Word of God and repent when necessary. It's something that we're called to do all the time is to strive for this holiness. You know, and then some days you do really well with it, and the next day you don't, but it's, we're, some, we're, we're called to do that. And here's the thing is that if we do that, and it was so, so we're called to be holy people, but here's what I want you guys to take with you today. So we're called to be holy people that are filled with holy anticipation. Okay, we are called to be holy people that are filled with holy anticipation. The problem is, is that sometimes we don't pursue holiness. Sometimes we don't pursue, uh, we, don't, we don't even care to pursue holiness. We don't even care to strive for the mark that God gives us because sometimes we just get more comfortable, right? I mean, sin is more comfortable to us because it's where we came from. It's like if you took a fish out of water, I mean, a fish is going to want to get back into water. When you take a, a, a human being who's fallen, broken, and sinful in nature, and all of a sudden uh, the sanctification process begins, uh, that believer is going to want to go back to sin, you and I struggle in that way, and so sometimes we don't pursue holiness. We want whatever we want, and we're just like, oh, thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. Now I'm going to do my thing, and that's where we are. And so this idea of pursuing holiness is something that misses us oftentimes. You know, we, uh, we, we find ourselves, as the Apostle Peter wrote, being conformed to the passions of our former ignorance. You know, now the word ignorance, that sounds really insulting, but what it really means is just like a lack of knowledge. You don't know. You're right, you don't know. And so what we find ourselves doing is we find ourselves being conformed by the passions, the things that we used to pursue, the things that we wanted to go after, the things that we used to want before Christ came into our lives. Right? And so that's something that we all find ourselves doing from time to time. And we decide to reject Jesus and we decide to go after the things that we used to want. You know, whether it was a good job, whether it was more money, whether it was a nicer house. So here's the question that I want to ask you guys today. How can you and I be sure that the things that we pursue and anticipate are holy? If we're called to be a holy set-apart people who anticipate holy things or or who who have uh, holy anticipation, how can we be sure of that? Well, I think we need to know what holy anticipation is. And I think that when we come to today's text in Luke 2, we find an idea, we get a picture of what holy anticipation is. So uh, I've been preaching through the, uh, the book of Luke. Because right? I think uh, we need to 
fall in love with Jesus all over again. So this sermon series is entitled uh, Rediscovering Jesus. It's a historical portrait of, of the God-man, of who Jesus was and why we should love him more than anything else. Right? And so the crazy thing is that at this point in time, uh, God had broken his silence. He had not spoken to the people of Israel for over 450 years uh, through prophets. It was just basically dead silence. But the last promise that he gave them was that I'm going to send a prophet and I'm going to send a Messiah who is going to redeem the world. And so now here we are in Luke chapter 2. That has just happened. God has broken that silence. He said it's happening now. Uh, we see two miraculous births take place. Jesus is born by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, see, we, see these, we see these crazy things happening. Last week we looked and all of a sudden um, here Jesus is born and, all, and God approaches shepherds, the lowest of the low in that society, to give them the good news before he gave it to everybody else. Right? So you have angels, like just countless angels that are worshiping God. Like this, There's this crazy stuff that's going on. And then all of a sudden, so now at this point in time in the story, things settle back down for Mary and Joseph. So they're sitting there and they have this baby who's God in the flesh, right? This, this, this little infant is probably uh, going to the bathroom, puking, vomiting, crying, screaming incessantly. Uh, you know, all this crazy stuff is going on. After the baby's eight days old, I mean, it's, it's very normal, right? So you have this massive supernatural experience and now here you are with this baby that is, uh, that's probably a nuisance and now everything is looking like just a normal human life. So eight days pass, and now the baby's circumcised, right? Which is the custom. That's what the law said, and so that's what they did. And then uh, because it was the firstborn, they ended up having to go to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice to uh, dedicate the firstborn child to God, just like everybody else did at that time. Uh, and Mary had to go and offer a sacrifice to be purified because you had to go and purify yourself after childbirth, according to the law found in the Old Testament. Right, and so here we go, after having this, the, the, these crazy things happen, angels come, announce these miraculous births, this miraculous birth takes place, and now here she is, she's healing up after childbirth, she's going to Jerusalem to go through the motions just like everybody else, and so now we find ourselves with this tension, right, between Jesus' humanity and his divinity, all right, here's this crazy thing, right, and so here's this little boy Jesus and Mary who's been told all these crazy things about how great her son's going to be, and she's going to go back to her town, and she's going to be mocked and ridiculed for the rest of her life because of the son, but she's just, and she's like, okay, this is crazy. What do I do with all of this? What do I do with all of this? This is a mess. What do I do with it? You know, and so all of a sudden she goes to the temple to go and do these rituals, right, and she encounters two people. She encounters a Simeon, and she encounters Anna, and all of a sudden she encounters this guy who God had told that he would not die until the Lord sent the Messiah. And so when this man sees this baby, that freshly circumcised, you know, just having to come up, he looks at him and, and he just breaks forth in worship. And he says, God, now I can die in peace. You have, you've fulfilled your promise to me. You've given me this great gift. Now think about this for a second. Here he is. Jesus hadn't done anything yet. He probably just puked and just soiled his diaper. That's probably all he had done. And, he, and here's this guy. He sees it. God's like, this is it. This is the promise that you've been given. This is, and here it is. And he's like, I can die in peace. I can die in peace now, right? And so here, and then Anna, the same thing. Uh, she, you know, we see her just devout, fasting, praying woman. And so here she is, and she'd been waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And so here she encounters these people who have lived their entire lives with holy anticipation. In a world that was not waiting for anything holy, we find people, a faithful few, who have been waiting with holy anticipation for God to make good on his promises. So today we're going to be talking about holy anticipation. I'm going to move through it pretty fast. I'm going to tell you guys there's five characteristics of holy anticipation that we get from this practice, I know, or from this passage, and I know a lot of you guys are going, five? Nick, you're going to, five, you're going to, you're, you're going to go through five points. Yes, I'm going to go through five points. It's not going to be very fast. I want you guys to write these down, okay? Holy anticipation is humbly Christ-centered. Holy anticipation is humbly Christ-centered. That's the first one. The second characteristic is this. Holy anticipation trusts in God's promises, okay? Holy anticipation trusts in God's promises. The third is Holy anticipation rejoices in the work of God's hands. Okay, holy anticipation rejoices in the work of God's hands. Number four, holy anticipation welcomes opposition. Okay, holy anticipation welcomes opposition. And the fifth characteristic is this, holy, anticip holy anticipation fights to keep anticipation holy. 
Okay, holy anticipation fights to keep anticipation holy. So let's look at this first point here. Right, holy anticipation is humbly Christ-centered. All right, we're going to look at uh, verses 22 through 24 out of uh, Luke 2. Luke writes, he says, and when, the time, and when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. All right, so here, Jesus circumcised eight days after his birth, and Mary had to be purified uh, after childbirth 33 days later. You find this, passage, you find this uh, command in Leviticus 12, verses 1 through 8. All right, so Jesus had to be presented before God as he was the firstborn, and anything that opened the womb was presented to God as holy. Right? The Lord said, that's mine. So you come and you dedicate this to God. And we see this in uh, Exodus uh, 13, verses 2 and 12. All right, and so I don't want us to miss this here, because when we, when we see this, we, we have to understand that what we're seeing is God, right? The Son of God. You have the highest position of authority and glory and power stepping down into the lowest possible position of authority, glory, and power. So you have the highest of highs stepping down into the lowest of lows. And if you just breeze over this passage, you miss it, right? Because not only did, did uh, Jesus come... Uh, in, in, into humanity, which is low enough, right? Sinful, broken humanity. The Son of God stepped down, took on human flesh in order to prepare a sacrifice for us so that we could be saved, right? But he stepped down into poor, low-class society. He didn't go to the high priest. He didn't go to the king. He didn't, you know, he did, God did not come into the world through uh, anybody with a lot of money. As a matter of fact, we see that here when, when it talks about what they offered for sacrifice, Right? Because in the law, what you see is that what, what was typically required for the sacrifice of purification was a lamb, unless you couldn't afford it. If you were poor and you couldn't afford what was really offered, you know, what was, what was first wanted by God for the, for the sacrifice, then you could offer two pigeons. You could offer a couple birds instead. You know, and so here we have people, there, you know, they're probably spending the last of their money to get these two birds to offer this sacrifice because they couldn't afford the lamb. Right? We see that, so not only did Jesus do that, then, he, then when, when he was born, the first people that it was announced to were shepherds. People who, they couldn't even give testimony in court because they weren't trusted. They were looked down upon. They stunk. They were probably criminals. They pro, you know, it was probably like some of the only jobs they could get given their reputation. Okay? But God came down and he spoke to shepherds and said, the Messiah has come. Behold to you this day a child is born. For you this great news has come down from heaven. Now here's the thing though is that so as we enter in, right, and we see these people that are sitting waiting with holy anticipation, and we see this humility that, that characterizes the gospel, that characterizes those who receive the gospel, that characterizes uh, Christ, I, want us, I don't want us to miss this, okay? Just as the righteous few in the first century, in first century Jerusalem were faithful to God when the majority was falling away, so are you and I called to remain faithful to God in the 21st century, when the majority of people are falling away. Doesn't change. You and, I are, you and I are called to be the faithful few who humbly look around right, in a world that wants to do anything they can to discredit the gospel, in a world that wants to do anything they can to say, are you kidding me? God doesn't exist. We came from the dirt billions and billions of years ago. You know, God, God doesn't exist. You know, we came here by chance. We can do anything we want. We get to determine our own morality. You know, nobody can tell me Jesus doesn't exist. I don't have to pay for my sin before a righteous God. You and I are called to say, yes, we do. I don't have all the answers for you, but I can tell you because Jesus changed my life. It's funny. Um, I have a, a mentor. He's a missions, he, he was a missions professor at Barclay College uh, named Prosperly. He's a small Indian man and one of the most powerful preachers, one of the most powerful speakers I've ever encountered in my life. Just his passion is ridiculously contagious. He's got, a, he's got a doctorate. He's taught in seminaries, colleges, preached all over the world. And he, one of the most profound things he's ever, he ever said to me, he said, sometimes, he said, you're going to come across people who have questions and you're not going to have the answer. He said, do not be arrogant enough to think that you need to give them an answer. He said, sometimes you have to give them the very uh, wise answer of I don't know. You just have to you speak from what you do know. I don't know. I don't know how to answer all of your questions, but I can tell you Jesus changed my life. 
I can tell you that no matter what, you know, I, I don't know, I, don't, I, I, can't give, I can't answer all your rejections, but what I can tell you is that I believe that God came into the world, put on human flesh, and died for my sin. I believe I'm going to have to answer, you know, to God's judgment one day. And I, though I can't give you all the, you know, all the arguments that you want answered, although I can't give you all the answers that you're demanding of me, I just want to tell you that Jesus changed my life. And, and that, so I humbly submit to you that God's wrath is coming and you should repent of your sin and give your life to Christ. You know, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to your question. Let me look into that for you. I don't know, but I can tell you that this faith has changed my life. Sometimes in order, uh, sometimes we, we get this mixed up in our head, right? Like when it comes to sharing our faith, like we, we tell ourselves, the reason I don't want to share my faith or tell anybody else about Jesus is because I don't have the right answers to say when somebody asks. You know, when somebody wants to know why uh, I believe what I believe, I, I don't know what to say. Well, here's the thing is that that right there, it's, it's, it's arrogance masked as humility. All right? we, sometimes we convince ourselves that we're being humble when we say that, but what, we're really, but what we're really doing is saying that God who's infinite, God who's so, who's so far above us, uh, somehow has to make himself palatable and understandable so that I can present it to other people and so that it makes perfect sense to me and everybody else. We're missing the point and we're getting our, our roles reversed. He created us. We didn't create him. Sometimes he's not going to make sense and that's okay. Our hope is in a risen Savior, a, a, a baby born of a virgin who grew and lived a sinless life and was nailed to a cross for our sin. That doesn't make sense. Then he rose from the dead. That doesn't make sense either. Then he ascended into heaven and we're waiting for him to come back physically as a body out of the sky back to the earth. That doesn't make sense either. That's crazy talk. So for us to think that we somehow have some, uh, that, we have an, that we have an infinite God and that our finite minds need to be able to understand him and to be able to give perfect answers to anybody else, it sounds really humble, but it's not. It's really arrogance masked as humility. So, for, you know, and so, so, what, so what does that mean? Like, what do we do, what do, we do with that? Like, I think we need to stop and we need to ask ourselves at any given moment, what am I looking forward to most? What am, I, am I looking forward to the day when God fill, uh, fulfills that promise and when Jesus comes back to redeem the world? Or am I kind of pushing the gospel out, am I looking forward to getting off work? Am I looking forward to, uh, I'm looking forward to when that check comes. I'm looking forward to uh, that day when I can retire. I'm looking forward to when I can finally get that house that I want. I'm looking forward to when my kids are out of the house. I'm looking forward to, to, when, uh, to when I graduate, to when I get the next thing. I'm looking forward to, you fill in the blank. What are we looking forward to more than we look forward to Jesus? We all do it. We all do it. And here's the thing, so what do we do with that? We go to God. We confess that we have many things that we look forward to and that we pursue and that we seek uh, and that we find more joy in than him. And we, at, and we repent of our sin and we ask him to change our heart. That's what you do with it. That's what you do with it. Um, you know, we need to own it and we need to go to him. So uh, holy anticipation humbly is, is humbly Christ-centered. Right? The second characteristic is holy anticipation trusts in the promises of God. Trusts in the promises of God. Verses 25 through 26, Luke 2. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. I don't want you guys to miss this here. Look at this. This man was righteous and devout, what made him righteous and devout? He was waiting. Right? He was anticipating the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Okay, so here's this man. What makes him righteous? What makes him righteous is that in a world that's no longer looking for God, in a world that's no longer waiting for God, here's this man who is humbly waiting for God. Waiting for God to do what? Waiting for God to fulfill the promise that he gave him. He said, you are not going to die until the Lord's Christ comes. And so here's this man in the temple waiting for the Messiah to come, All right? In a world that was no longer waiting. They had their own ideas of what that would look like. But here's a man whose righteousness is characterized by the fact that he's still waiting. All right? The Holy Spirit was upon him, and in the midst of a Jewish culture that was growing further and further away from God by the minute, uh, you know, God promised him that he wouldn't see death before the Messiah would come. That's a pretty cool promise, isn't it? I mean, that's a, pr that's a pretty cool promise. I mean, think about if God, if, if God really told you that uh, you wouldn't see death until Jesus came back. 
I'd probably tell you, well, don't go tell everybody that, first of all. Don't go tell everybody that you know the date and the time is going to happen before I die. Like, don't go there. A lot of people do that kind of stuff. Don't do that. You know what I mean? But humbly wait for God to fulfill his promise. You humbly wait for God to do what he said he's going to do. So we promise that Jesus is going to come back. We promise that, we're promised that he's going to come back and restore the world. Now, I don't know about you. I have a hard time with politics. I really do. Um, this last election, I brought myself to somehow vote for Donald Trump. Okay, I, swear, I said I wasn't going to vote. And I'm not, extreme, I'm not really proud of that. Um, but here's the thing is that he got me by appealing to the religious right and saying, well, I'm going to stop abortion. I, hap- I happen to believe that abortion is one of the greatest evils that plagues our society today. Okay, so I swore that I wasn't going to vote. And here's a guy, and he comes in, and he says, I'm going to do it. And I thought that he was just brash and hard-headed enough to actually keep his promise. Several weeks ago, I get this, uh, I get this email. Or I, I get this, uh, this email. It's got this headline of a news article in it. And, you know, basically said that Donald Trump is pulling out and changing his plans to, you know, about, about uh, defunding Planned Parenthood. I remember I was so angry because, like, I wasn't even going to vote. And I actually voted and I got really emotionally involved in the last election. And here, you know, and, and all of a sudden I found myself getting really, really, really worked up. And I had to catch myself. What was I getting worked up about? I was getting worked up because a politician lied. I was getting worked up because a politician made a promise and in that in the, in the, uh, from the best I knew right then and there that he was breaking that promise. If he'd have kept that promise, does that change anything? Does that, does that mean that the world is going to get, you know, does that mean that all of a sudden, like, I can just take a deep breath and wait and now uh, I don't have to look forward to Jesus coming back like, like I was before? Uh-uh. Am I promised that the world is going to get better before Jesus can, it comes back? No. But sometimes, what we have, if, if, we're not, if we're not careful, what we, what we catch ourselves doing is clinging to promises of other people. So whether it's politicians, whether it's uh, your boss offering you some promotion that you're never actually going to get, uh, no matter what it is, we find ourselves clinging to promises from other people uh, more than we're clinging to the promises of God. And the minute you do that, you're going to find yourself let down. Because when those promises fall through, or when all of a sudden you get what was promised to you, and you realize that, wait a second, this isn't all it was cracked up to be. I just got this new job, and now it's more responsibility. It's more money, but now I never get to see my family. You know, it, it, now, now what? What do I do with this? Oh, well, you bought, you, you bought a lie. You told yourself that your life was going to all of a sudden get better when this promise came through, and it came through, and now, and, and now your life is still just, it's still just as broken as it was before. We need to understand that any time that we look forward to something and anticipate something more than we are looking forward to God's promises, we need to understand that what we've done at that point in time is that, we cho- that, that we, we've put something else in God's place. The Bible refers to that as idolatry. Right? We, can make a, we can make idols out of, uh, out, of, out of politicians. We can make idols out of uh, theological authors. We can make idols out of pastors. We can make idols out of families. We can make idols out of uh, you name it. Anything that God gives us that we put before him, we make idols out of it, happens all the time. So what do we do with that? I think you can ask ourselves, what lies am I believing or trusting over God's promises? Right? We can look at it and say, well, what, li- what lies am I, am I believing? Right? So one of the things that plagues American men more than anything today and American Christian men, it's no, it's no different, is pornography. Right? Pornography is, is, is ridiculous. It makes more money. The pornography industry makes more money than all your major tech companies okay, in a year. That's crazy. Okay? So any time that a man goes and, and, and does that, and a Christian man goes and does that, right? And so they, they say, okay, I want this instant gratification that I, that I, uh, I know how to get it. So I'm going to go and I'm, I'm going to get it. And now what you've done is you, if you said, you've said that that instant gratification is going to be more fulfilling than the spouse that God has given you. That instant gratification, that lie, that if you just do this, everything's going to be great, is better than what God has given you in a spouse. Ouch, that hurts. If you've ever, if you've ever done that, like, and, and we don't, we don't think that way, but it's true. Anytime we find ourselves, and, and you find it in the more subtle things. Anytime we find ourselves, like God, you know, I would spend more time in prayer and in Your Word, but you know, I've just got way too many things to do. You know, you told yourself that every, all those things that you're pursuing are now more important than you get, getting yourself before God in the day. Do it all the time. We say, this thing, this fulfillment, this thing that I'm pursuing is better to me than God is, so I'm going to pursue it first. We all do it. 
We all do it in various forms or fashion. We need to own it. We need to repent of it and ask God to change our hearts. Say, God, help me to anticipate you more than I anticipate anything else. Help me to pursue you more than I, more than I pursue anything else. That brings me to, my third, to the third uh, characteristic of holy anticipation. Holy anticipation rejoices in the work of God's hands. Rejoices in the work of God's hands. It's in this 20, uh, starting in verse 27 in Luke 2. It says, And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light, for revelation, a, light of, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Simeon had seen God's promise come true before his very eyes. He, 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 I don't know how he knew it. it was pretty, he's, it's, the word says that he had the Holy Spirit upon him, and as soon as he saw this baby, he knew that this was God's promise fulfilled. You know? Now that's crazy, though, if you think about it, because here, do you think, I don't think Jesus, he probably didn't look anything different than any other baby. You know, he was going through all the same things as, as any other baby, and yet all of a sudden here he is, and, and God says, this is it, this is the promise that you've been waiting for. Here's what he didn't do. He didn't say, well, God, I need some other sign. I need some other miracle. You know, I want to see this kid walk on water. I want to see him raise the dead, right? Which is what, in the midst of his earthly ministry, everybody else, it didn't matter what he did. They're like, well, we need another sign. We need another sign. We need another sign to, to know, you know, that I can actually put my faith in you. That's not what Simeon did here. You know, he, he looked at it and he rejoiced in God's promises. He looked forward to God's promises. He trusted me. He goes, no, God, you've told me that this is it. This is what you promised me. You fulfilled it. I'm good. I can go. You can take me right here, right now. I can die right here on the temple floor. I'm good. I'm good. And he rejoiced. Like he saw this baby and he grabbed him and he's looking at him and he's blessing God because uh, he saw this baby and he knew that God had fulfilled his promise. Let me ask you something. What makes you rejoice? What makes you really rejoice? Right? I, I mean, I know that for me, if I'm watching a football game, right, if I'm watching the Broncos or something and I'm, and I'm sitting there and the, and the game's real close, and I, think that, and I think that the game's not going to go my way or all of a sudden something happens and my team pulls it out last minute w against all odds, I find myself on the edge of my seat and this is one of the reasons I had to stop watching football because if it didn't go my way, I'd get really mad and that would last all week long. But if it went really well, like I would, I would go from angry to mad and I would jump up and scream. I might knock something over and I would rejoice that my team just won that ball game when they should have lost. Anybody in here that watches sports or has a favorite team, I know you can relate to that. I know you can. When's the last time you rejoiced in God over that, uh, that, that way? When's the last time you really sat there and, 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 and you saw the hand of God move in your life and you, just, you were like, yes, I can't believe that happened. Praise God, he answered a prayer. We don't do that, do we? We don't do that. We're like, well, you know, that, maybe, maybe he didn't answer that prayer. Maybe it was the doctor's. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe that healing came just by the hands of the doctors. You know, maybe, maybe it was because, well, people get over sicknesses all the time. You know, crazier things have happened. Eh, no big deal. No big deal. Do you rejoice? Do you trust in God's promises above all else? Do, do we rejoice in that? What, what, what else do we re rejoice to? Well, you know, what, what else are we rejoicing in? What we've done is we've said that something else at that point in time is going to be the source of my joy now, right? So, so if I can find myself rejoicing more over a football game than I do over God's work, then what am I saying? I'm saying, God, you're, you're okay, you're cool, like I, I pay lip service here, but really, like, I'm more about this football game. Let my team win. Then, then we'll talk. Then, we, then we've got some joy to be had. And here's the, here's the thing, right, is that some people, they just cop out when you, when you confront them with this. You know, they cop out and they say, well, you know, uh, I just don't get excited about God like that. Some people do, you know, and, some, and that's fine, but I don't. And that's just not the way I'm wired. That's the way God's telling you you're wired. That's the way God's telling you that you are to be. Like, God wants us to find more joy in Him than we do in anybody else. And if we don't, then we need to look at it and acknowledge that there's a problem. And it's called sin. There's a problem, it's called idolatry. There's a problem, like we've found something else in our life that we find more fulfillment out of. That's a problem. 
We need to repent of that problem. We need to ask God to restore our hearts from that problem. And if you can honestly sit there and say, uh, you know, no, you know, I, I, get, I get more excited about sports, or I get more excited about Facebook, or I get more excited about my entertainment. I'm going to pursue those things before I pursue God. Don't, you, don't, don't cop out. Own your sin, repent, and ask God to give you the heart that he wants us to have, according to Scripture. A lot of people are like, I don't have to be into it as, you know, just as much as you are. Yes, you do. That's what God says. It's what God says. It's not what I say. Uh, uh, it's what God says. You know, here's, the, here's the deal, you guys, that if the Bible is truth, and his promises are true, okay, and if you find yourself getting more excited about these other things than, than we do about God, and you don't care about that, and you really look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, well, whatever. You might not know Jesus. And I want to encourage you to repent of your sin, cry out to Jesus because heaven and hell are real and you need to be saved. Like that, That's a real thing. Like If you can look at what God's word says and realize that you're not there and you don't care, and you don't care, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. That's not holy anticipation. And we're called the holy anticipation. And if we don't care about what God wants in our lives, then I would say that we're not worshiping God. That we don't know God. You know, and sometimes, so much of the Christian walk, you guys, is literally just looking at what God wants from us, acknowledging that it's not there, and asking, God, create this in me, because I don't have it. Create that awe and that wonder in me, God, because I don't have it, right? I mean, I, I live in America and everything's Christian. There's 50, Bible, 50 different Bibles to choose from when I walk into Dylan's. I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. You know, like, I, I don't get excited about it. You know, and so we look at that and we're like, God, make it real to me. Lord, make it awesome for me. Please, God, impress yourself upon me in a way to where I get excited. I want to be more joyous in you than I am in anything else. Help me, God. Forgive me for my sin and create in me the heart that you want me to have. Now, here's the thing, though. That kind of self-examination and that kind of prayer is far more honoring to God than lying to yourself and everybody else around you, pretending that it's all okay. All right? So when you, when you don't have that and you lie to yourself, you're like, no, it's fine. That's not honoring to God. But when you look at your heart and you say, I don't have it, God, can you give it to me? Can you create that in me? That's honoring to God. Acknowledging your need and acknowledging that he's the only one who can give it to you. That's God honoring. The fourth characteristic of holy anticipation is, uh, is that it welcomes opposition. It welcomes opposition. Verses 34 through 35. Luke writes, he says, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So here Simeon tells Mary that his son is going to cause a lot of strife. That her son is going to, uh, that yes, he's going to save many. And that this great redemption that God is doing in the world is going to happen. But he says that your son is appointed for the, ri- for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed. Okay, Here's the, here's the thing, you guys. That the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His teachings. right, The things that he says. And the fact that nobody stands before God on his own merit. You want to know what that does? That spits in the face of our, uh, of our self-sufficient attitudes. This idea that we can do it on our own. This idea that, that I, can, I can carry my own weight. You know, we're, uh, you know we're, we're Americans. We can pull up our bootstraps, can't we? We just pull up our bootstraps. We get out there and we get it done. We just do it on our own. I don't need you or anybody else to pay for my sin because I carry that weight on my own shoulders. I don't need a savior. I don't need a savior. I do it myself. This idea that we all need a savior, this idea that God looks at each and every last one of us and says, I don't care how good you are, you're not good enough. But I'm not telling you that to make you feel small. I'm telling you that because, here, here's my son. He's good enough. He willingly stepped down and, paid to, and gave his life for yours. Accept it. 
Accept it. My gift to you, salvation. And yet we look at it and say, no, I don't need it. Right? The idea of the gospel that spits in the face of our self-sufficient attitudes. Our hearts naturally oppose this, you guys, because you, know, you want to know why? Because several thousand years ago, back in the Garden of Eden, when God told us not to do something, we said, I'll decide for myself what good and evil is. And we decided to do it because we, we accepted it. We believed the lie that Satan told in the beginning, and it's the same lie that we're believing now. You know, anytime we sin, we're saying, oh, did God really say that, you know, I'll determine for myself what good and bad is. Let me go ahead and just do this, and I'll figure it out for myself. I don't really care what the Word of God says. This idea that we need to humble ourselves before God and accept His gracious gift of salvation and continually repent in this way, that's offensive to us. And that's okay. We need to own that. That's, that, that's all right. Holy anticipation... The, what I'm talking about today, it welcomes this kind of opposition in our life. Because when we look at it and we, we realize that here's God's standard, here's my feelings, here's how I feel about it, and this is what God's Word says, okay, this hurts. i got to swallow my pride now. I have to acknowledge that my heart's hard, and so i got to bring it before God and ask Him to soften it. We look at it and we say, God, whatever it's going to take, I want you to have this in my life. So, so please bring that opposition. Come in and crush my pride. Come in and make me humble. Come in and make me the man that you want me to be. He tells Mary, right? You talk about, I mean, God coming in to redeem the world. And you could, I couldn't have said it. I don't think any of us could have said it better to her. You know, he states that Jesus' life would bring about the piercing of her, own, of her soul with a sword. So here, she is told that, this, that the most glorious thing that God's ever done in the world is going to happen. She's going to be the vessel that God uses to bring the Messiah into the world. She gets to watch him grow, watch him grow in his stature, and watch him do miracles, watch him do all sorts of crazy things that people are going to talk about forever. And then she gets to watch him be nailed to a cross. This child is going to bring about the piercing of your soul with a sword. That's pretty intense. She could have said, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for this. And this kind of thing, it, 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 is, it says that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Okay? The gospel serves as a flashlight into our souls. Right? The gospel, it's like God shines light into our hearts, minds, and souls. And it reveals our arrogance and it reveals our sin that stands in opposition to God. Right? When we look at this, the, the humility that this calls us to, you know, and, that's, and that's why, that's the real reason why people don't accept it when you present it to them. Because if you say hell's real, if you repent of your sin, accept this gift and, and, and God will save you, and then you say no, what you're saying is I don't need it. You know, and so you're rejecting this, right? And so the, the gospel really does, it serves like this flashlight that's going to uh, shine into the hearts of people. Right? And in, those who are welcome to this and repent of what is found in their hearts and in their souls will be saved. Those who reject it and rely on their own self-sufficiency and pride will not. They won't. That's, that's, what, that's what the Word says. All right Now, here's the thing. This sounds really arrogant, right? It, it does, but it, it's not. This comes from being so convinced, right? This idea of welcoming that opposition into your life, both internally, like when, when, you, when you allow God to change you with His Word, and externally, like when you're willing to call sin out in culture, and, you know, when culture says, this is okay, we're good now, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm going to do what I want, and we're called to say, no, 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 it's not okay. We need to stop that, right? This, it sounds really arrogant, but it's not. Right? This, this welcoming of this opposition, it comes from being so convinced about you know, so convinced that what you believe to be about what you believe to be right, and being convicted to the point of being willing to face whatever opposition and hardship may come because of the value of what because the value of what you're pursuing is far greater than anything else. When you understand that that conviction, right, when that conviction sets in, and you understand that that, that conviction is going to drive you to do things that are going to cost you greatly, and you look at it and you're like, I don't care because I believe this. I don't care because this is true, and I know that other people are going to be offended by it, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say it anyway. 
You welcome the opposition because you are per, you're convinced that the value of what you're pursuing is greater than anything else this world has to offer, including your comfort, including the peace in your relationships, including uh, your jobs, including all those things. You're, you know, that, that's what it means to be convicted to the point of being willing to speak out against something that you're going to encounter opposition for. Our own denomination ordains... LGBT clergy on the coast. It happens. Our own denomination is okay with that. One of the things, you know, I don't know if you guys know how the 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 uh, ABC is orchestrated, but you have the ABC USA sits over the whole country, and then you have the different regions underneath it. And the regions on the coast are more liberal, and they're the ones who are saying, we're good with this, we want to do this, we're, 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 we're fine with it. The central region is not, you know, but they say we're still going to continue to support, and we're still going to continue to do these things, or to, you know, we're not, we're not asking you to do it, but we're asking you to continue to give your money so that you support it. You know, as I've stumbled upon that, like, I, even as I say that, like, I'm less than a year here, you guys, and for me to stand up and say, and say this in, in a church that's been around for 125 years could be career suicide. It is what it is, but this is something that needs to be addressed. It's something that needs to be called out in, in, among our denomination and our church. It's something that needs to be stated, that people need to be made aware of. And so when all of a sudden these things happen, you know, and we keep our mouths shut and we say, uh, you know, we say that, you know what, the comfort of the relationship is more important than calling out the sin. What we're saying is that the comfort of that relationship is more important than what God's word says. It's not. It's not. It welcomes opposition. Holy anticipation welcomes opposition. We sometimes convince ourselves that that, that compromise is tolerance, but it isn't. Compromise, when it comes to this kind of thing, doing things that are absolutely, that are blatantly sinful in the name of God, what you're doing is you're rejecting God and you are saying that I want to please man instead. There's so many things within the church today, uh, you know, so many within the church today, they're, they're scared to take a stand for the gospel because they know that it'll bring opposition and hardship. It will cause you to stand up and say, no, God's not okay with our culture and where it is, and neither am I. And you have to be willing to stand up and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to stand and I'm going to make that stand, and that's okay. We're called to be missionaries in a fallen world, but we're not called to pretend that God's okay with it. We're not called to pretend that God's okay with the, with the fallenness and with the sin in the world. Right? In regard to where we're at with our own denomination, we need to say something. We need to do something. Like we, we can't, you know, if we look at what God's word says and, 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 what, and the people that we're sending missions money to is spending the money in this way and they're, and they're on board with all this, we need to acknowledge that we can say all we want to that we don't support things, but if we're giving our entire missions budget to it, then we are essentially supporting it. The fifth, uh, the fifth and final um, uh, characteristic of holy anticipation is this, is that it fights to keep anticipation holy. Holy anticipation fights to keep anticipation holy. Verses 36 through 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in, in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then, as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Here we're introduced to Anna, right? And Anna is a prophetess. She comes from a long line of people who were prophets and prophetesses. And, and uh, you know, and so she, she, she lived a long life. She lost her husband years earlier. And she fought with fasting and prayer to keep her anticipation holy. You guys know why Christians fast? Like historically, do you know why Christians would say, I'm going to go without food and I'm going to enter into prayer? Because when you go without food and you pursue God in the midst of hunger pangs, you're saying that, uh, you're, you're basically saying, I want to pursue God and I want to hunger for God more than I want food. I need God more than, I, more than my body needs food. 
And so when somebody is fasting for spiritual purposes, like when a Christian fasts, as they're called to do in the Bible, that's what you're saying. You're saying, I know that my body needs food, but I need God more. So I'm going to forgo these meals for a minute. And, when, and, and, and so when we feel those hunger pangs, it comes up as a reminder that, wait a second, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah, because I need God more than I need food. I need God more than I need food. And so here what we see is that here's Anna. She lived a, I mean, she, she lived a long life. She had a husband who ended up dying on her. And here, what, what was she doing? She was worshiping. It's, it, you know, it, says, it says that she didn't leave the temple. It says that she was worshiping with fasting and prayer. Now, this didn't mean that she lived at the temple. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But it meant that any chance she got that she was in there fasting, praying, worshiping. She wanted God more than anything else. And she wanted to go through fasting so then that way she could remind herself that I need God more than food. And so I want to remind myself of that. It's funny, D.A. Carson, a theologian, he, he writes this and it's painfully true. He says, people do not drift toward holiness. Okay? You don't go toward holiness uh, automatically. He says, apart from grace-driven effort, we have to pursue holiness. He says, apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. He goes on, he says, we drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and we call it freedom. We drift toward, stu- toward, toward superstition and we call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control, and we call it relaxation. He says, we slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. When you just decide that I'm going to throw my hands up and, you know, God's just going to do what he's going to do, and I'm going to be on Facebook... You know, I don't need to pray. I'm gonna, you know, I don't need to fast. I don't need to pursue God. You know, I go to church on Sunday. I'm good. Uh, I don't need to carve out time for prayer. Guys, we need both. We can't. We can't. We can't just do this. We we don't just drift towards holiness. We are naturally bent because of our sinful nature to go away from God, not toward God. And so, when we don't pursue through efforts to get closer to God, we naturally just float away. And then you come back on Sunday and you just kind of get this little nudge to go back. And then you go back out and you're just like, I'm going to float away again for the week. And what would happen if you made the conscious effort to say, I'm not going to float away this week. I'm not going to float away. Uh, instead, I'm going to make sure that I can spend 10 minutes a day in the Word. And I'm going to spend five minutes after that in prayer. Little thing. You're talking about 15 minutes. I want you guys to stop for a second and just think, right? Uh, like, how much time do we spend doing things that we enjoy? How much time do we spend uh, fishing? How much time do we spend uh, hunting? How much time do we spend on Facebook? How much time do we spend watching movies and TV? You can't afford 15 to 20 minutes a day to keep yourself from drifting throughout the week. That's not right. That's not right. And you cannot lie to yourselves, and I can't lie to myself and pretend that when we uh, go and choose all these other things over God, that he's happy with it and that he's okay, and that he just says, God bless you, go. He's not. He's not. We turn our back on him and we pursue the things of the world and we come back to church on Sunday and we're like, praise God. And he's like, what is that? He's like, what is that? It's rituals. We need to be intentional and disciplined about our own spiritual formation, you guys, and the care of our souls. You guys, to say this isn't important or to say that, oh, it it just looks different for me. You know, some people are called that, some people aren't. That's a cop-out. It's a cop-out, and it's, neglectful, and it's being neglectful in what the Word of God calls us to do. Did Jesus die for your sin? Yes. Is your salvation based entirely upon His work? Yes. Does God still call you to strive to get closer to Him? Yes. And He knocked down the wall of sin so that you can. So what are we doing to keep our minds and our hearts and our souls holy? What are we doing to make sure that what drives us is holy anticipation and not the pleasures of the world. What are we doing? And I can't answer that for you. I mean, like, I, I know how I engage those things in my own life, but I'm telling you that there are spiritual disciplines. I'm telling you that there are things that, that need to be done. And so you, that's between you and God. I can't make you do those things. Can you fast once a week? Some of you guys are like, I have health issues. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do that. Cool, don't fast food. Can you, can you let go of Facebook for a week? A day? Can you let go of your email for a day? Can you not watch TV for a day? 
You know, can you, can you do something that you're going to miss tremendously so that when you're missing it, you're, all, you're reminded, you're like, oh yeah, I need God more than that. I need God more than this thing that, I, that, I'm, that I've made a fixture in my life. We need to search our hearts, you guys. We need to make sure that the things that we're waiting for, the things that we're pursuing, the things that we anticipate are the things that God's Word calls us to anticipate and not the things that the world wants us to anticipate. Because God does call us to be holy. And holy people are to be filled with holy anticipation. Let's pray.